Take your Bibles, first of all, here and turn to Luke 24, verse 27. Luke 24. In verse 27. And some of you might be familiar with this story. This happens on Resurrection Day, okay? And the uh, Easter Sunday. And after the Lord had appeared to uh, some of the women in that, well, he takes a walk going to Emmaus, one of those little towns not too far from Jerusalem there. And he meets a couple of the disciples, and they didn't recognize him. And so as he's going along there and that, and they're wondering about what has happened and, and, uh, and so forth and that, and won't go into all those details, but eventually he gets to the point there where he uh, shows, he folds there, that's, reveals that he is Lord Jesus Christ, that he has been resurrected. And they didn't recognize him there in the beginning, but uh, anyway, he enlightens them there on that. And then he proceeds, and it says here in verse 27, and beginning at Moses. Now remember, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, okay, starting with Genesis and, of course, going through uh, Deuteronomy there. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them to all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now that is quite a task. Okay, I wonder how many hours that took. Although he didn't have to look them up and that, he had them all memorized and so forth from Genesis 13, or Genesis 3, verse 15 through Malachi and so forth. And he could go through it because they had just the Old Testament at that time. But he went through all those, all scriptures, says all scriptures, okay. And so he went through all of them and expounded to them, you know, the ones that pertained to him and how he had fulfilled them. And that up to that point, okay, and so that was quite a task, all right, and and so that would take quite a bit of time, and we don't have that much time to go through all those, okay, and so we're not even going to attempt to get to all that, but we're going to uh, cover a number of them anyway, all right, and so I've broken this uh, down here, this outline, his birth, his ministry, his crucifixion, in which we're going to cover uh, most of them, and his resurrection, and his first advent, and so. These are messianic prophecies, okay, remember the Messiah is just another term for the word Christ or the anointed one that was fulfilled by Christ during the first advent, okay, and so his first coming, and we're looking forward to him coming again. So if you take your Bibles, we're going to go to a very familiar one here, and to the prophet Isaiah, so go back in the, we're going to spend a lot of time in the prophet of Isaiah uh, tonight, and a number of others, sometimes Isaiah, they, they say that his book is the gospel, according to Isaiah. And we'll see why, I think, when we get done with our study tonight, why they might, people might think that. But the, in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, very, very familiar a prophecy here. If you look there, Isaiah says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, now, so that was Isaiah 7, verse 14. And uh, how many have heard that before? I mean, most of us have, okay? And especially around Christmas time, well, that's a, a favorite verse that preachers will use and referring to the Lord's incarnation, becoming a man. But we'll see how that is fulfilled here. Go to the book of Matthew, the first gospel. And in chapter 1, after you get through the genealogy there, then you'll look at verse 20 and through verse 25. And it says, But while he thought on these things, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised uh, from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had uh, bidden him, and took unto him his wife, 
and knew her not till they, she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Okay, and so that's the fulfillment there, okay, of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Now, we're going to go all the way back to, uh, I try to keep this in somewhat of a chronological order, but uh, maybe not completely. But in this one here, you need to go back to the very beginning, the first messianic promise. And we've talked about this one before, is in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And this is after the downfall of man, the sin there in the Garden of Eden, and the human race is lost because of sin, and yet God provides provision, okay, for salvation, okay. And he does that, he's already has it, didn't, didn't not take him by surprise. And so anyway, he promises here, he says, and uh, talking to the serpent, who is, of course is Satan, okay, he already tells a, a prophecy about that in verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And uh, how many have ever seen a snake so far this year? Hmm? They're still just crawling around, aren't they? They don't have any legs, okay, or feet or anything like that, okay? They're just crawling around, they're lying around, and crawling around on their belly, aren't they? Okay, and that's the way it's been now for, you know, 6,000 years, whatever. And he says here, between thy, and, and I will put enmity, that means an, an antagonism, okay? Uh, same thing really as being an enemy between thee, talking about the serpent or Satan, and the woman, okay? Uh, talking about the, remember, it's not, not the man, okay? And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay, this is the, uh, the conflict here that goes down through those ages. And Genesis 3, verse 15 is the first of the messianic promises and shows that God has provided, okay, a, uh, a solution of the sin problem and tells that he will, that the Messiah, it shall bruise, it's talking about her seed there, the Messiah, it shall bruise thy head, a deadly wound, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay, and that was picturing, that was foretelling what was going to be there on the cross. Okay, as the Messiah is uh, crucified there for our sins. All right. Now, another one here, uh, turn over to the uh, prophet Micah. So you go beyond Isaiah and the major prophets there. And go to the prophet Micah, M-I-C-A-H. And this is one that you usually hear around Christmas time. Micah 5 and verse 2, where Micah the prophet says, But thou, now this is about 700 years before the birth of Christ, okay? If you have a Schofield Bible, it says around uh, 710 B.C., okay, around 700 B.C. says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, thou, thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So he's talking about how the Messiah existed before he was to be born there in Bethlehem. And if you turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 2, not too far from here. Matthew chapter 2, and verses 5 and 6. And remember, this is when the, the visit of the Magi, okay, or the wise men. And this takes approximately two years after the birth of Christ, all right? Because he's in a house, and uh, anyway, they finally find him here. And it, uh, remember that uh, Herod, okay, said he wanted to come and worship him, okay? They wanted to, uh, to uh, know, okay, uh, people wanted to know where the, uh, the Messiah, the king of the Jews would be. And he says here uh, in verse 4, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Saying, Thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, 
art not the least among the prince of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that is to rule my people Israel. All right, and so that's a fulfillment there. And as the uh, Magi were coming to worship the king, worship the Messiah, and uh, they were told here that uh, it was, they knew it was going to be in Bethlehem. All right. There's another interesting one from a fella that you wouldn't think would be too much interested that, that you'd want to uh, study about, but this is in the book of Numbers. Turn back to the book of Numbers. This is after Leviticus, and in Numbers 24, if you remember that wicked old prophet Balaam, but he was used. In verse 17, and he says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, talking about Israel, and a scepter. Okay, that's a sign of a king there. And royalty shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Okay, so a star out of Jacob. And so this is one of the things, evidently, the, uh, the wise men, when they were doing their Bible studies, saw, they knew they were looking for a star. And then when they see that star, they're following it. And if you look over to, in your uh, outline there, in uh, Numbers 24, and I think we're back to, uh, let's look here. Numbers, yeah, back to Matthew, okay, chapter 2. And verses 7 through 10, where it says, Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search, till, uh, search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And so anyway, they, it says, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went uh, before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. Okay. And when they were come into the house, not, the, not a manger, okay, not a stable, okay, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All right. So therefore, that was a fulfillment there. The, talking about the scepter of the, or the star of, that comes out of Jacob. Now, let's go back. We're going to see a couple more here. Go back to Isaiah chapter 9. And there's more than just the ones we're going to go over here tonight. It's a, if you want to make a real study of it. Be an interesting one to see how many. But Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Where I get the right book here. Yeah, 9, verse 6, where it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So again here, you see that something is uh, fulfilled uh, early here, and then a future fulfillment much later that takes place, even within the same verse. But Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, we see here, it talks about to us a child is born. And then you can go back there. Uh, to, uh, uh, let's see, Matthew. Yeah, Matthew chapter 2, and we won't turn uh, back there again, okay? But it uh, tells about how that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, no, it's Luke chapter 2. Okay, Luke chapter, so you might want to turn back to Luke chapter 2. So as you're filling in the blank there, Luke chapter 2. And verse 7. Where 
for it says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Okay, so again, talking about being a child is born. And then the last one here is birth. Uh, you can turn back to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1 and Matthew 1 verse 1. So you're close to Matthew, so just go to the very beginning of Matthew there. This one you have to think about a little bit, where it says in Matthew 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then you go back to Isaiah chapter 11. In verse 1, and it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Okay. Who was the son of Jesse? That was David. Okay. And so it's, that's why it says in Matthew chapter 1. Okay. Here in verse 1, the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So the connection there, okay, as Jesse was uh, David's father. So that's a fulfillment there. All right. Any questions on this Roman numeral number one here? Okay, let's go on then to his ministry. And we touched upon this before, but you need, while you're in the book of Isaiah, go to Isaiah chapter 61. And verse 2. Actually, verses 1 and 2. And you get there. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Okay? Take special note of verse 2 there. Then go back to uh, uh, Luke chapter 4. So you can fill in the blank there. Luke chapter 4. And verses 17 to 21. And remember that Jesus is in the early part of his ministry here. He's in the synagogue. Okay. And it says, And there delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance uh, to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. He stopped right there. All right. That's as far as he went, because he, he was fulfilling. In fact, he tells him here, This day, okay, this is fulfilled in verse 11, 21. And he says, he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. But he didn't go on because that hasn't happened yet. The vengeance of our God. Okay, that's, that's what you're talking about 2, 000, at least 2,000 years later. Okay, when the, the battle of Armageddon at the end of uh, Daniel's 70th week. Okay, when the, uh, he wraps this thing up. It's kind of, I was thinking about this this past week. You know, we were talking about Daniel's 70 weeks there last uh, uh, couple weeks ago and how that the 69th week, 483 years, was fulfilled on Palm Sunday. And then God stopped the clock from ticking. They only had seven years to go for the end of that 490 years, when, uh, uh, 70 times seven. And the Lord promised that at the end of that 490 years, all the problems of sin and everything was going to be taken care of. The kingdom was going to be set up. They only had seven more years. And yet they rejected their Messiah. And they blew it. <laughs> okay. I mean, this was a genuine offer that the Lord gave them, that the Lord Jesus did. And uh, yet we wonder, you know, how can all these, some of these other, well, the Lord can work out those circumstances, you know, to make those fulfillments. But it was a genuine offer, and they rejected it. Okay? And even after his resurrection, there was plenty of evidence that he was, had truly been resurrected, that he was the Son of God, that he was the King of Israel. I mean, it was 500 people that had saw him at one time and numerous occasions when he was there. And yet they still, the leaders of Israel at that time, 
uh, continued to reject him, and they blew it then. All right, and they, if they had just accepted him at that time, they could have had the kingdom set up, and you could have had the thousand years reign, and we'd be into the eternal state at this time. And if the Lord had providentially had figured out that we were going to actually be living, us right here in that kingdom, think of the things we wouldn't have to put up with today, okay? Wouldn't have to put up with woke. <laughs> I'm so sick and tired of woke <laughs> and all the perversions out there. Each day I say, come Lord Jesus, whatever. Here's something like that on the TV. You think of all these other things like taxes. Okay, that's another thing, right? And aches and pains and all these other things that we have to deal with, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, just getting old or older, okay, but uh, getting older and that, all these different uh, maladies we have, we wouldn't have to deal with any of those things, you know, if we were in that eternal state and those guys blew it. They not only blew it for themselves, okay, but they blew it for us at this point. But anyway, but that was a genuine offer, you know, and yet uh, God stopped that clock and someday he's going to hit that pendulum again when the Antichrist confirms the covenant, the, the false peace with the nation of Israel, and then he will start that seven, those last seven years to tick off, and then we'll see the consummation of all that. But nonetheless, we see this ministry that the Lord Jesus has that he's going to fulfill. Okay, but anyway, uh, that was in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 2. Okay, go on to um, uh, Isaiah chapter 42. And verses 6 to 7, where he says here, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant or a testament, talking about the New Testament, of the people for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Okay, you might want to turn back then to Matthew chapter 4. And remember that the book of Matthew was written, especially to the Jews, to show them that the Lord Jesus Christ was truly the Messiah of Israel. And that, uh, and so in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 12 through 16, you'll see now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast and the borders of Zebulun and Ephthalim, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephilim by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region, and shadow of death, light is sprung, upon, sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, talking about his ministry there again, another fulfillment. Okay, going on here, let's turn to Zechariah. Chapter 9. Now you go back to the Old Testament. This is a familiar portion. To me, when after I first got saved and started studying prophecy, I thought this was fascinating. Okay. And uh, this is when Jesus, if you look there, and you might want to turn also there to Matthew chapter 21. So take your Bibles and turn there. Matthew chapter 21. And he has his disciples go get the, uh, the colt of a donkey to ride in on Palm Sunday in verses, uh, chapter 21, verses 1 through 10. And you'll see here in Zechariah chapter 9, in verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, on a colt, the foil of an ass. Okay? So that was a prophecy that telling about the Messiah, how he was going to be on a donkey's colt there. And then if you go to Matthew chapter 21, and you'll see here, and... Uh, Verse 4, it says, All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, 
saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and the colt in the foam of an ass. And the disciples went, and did as Jesus commanded them. Okay, so there was a, a fulfillment there, right, then at that point. Right? It's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, it was a, there was a, a story or a book or something like that written about maybe 50 years ago. I think it was, some, it was called The Passover Plot. And the idea was here that things can be arranged, <laughs> okay? Circumstances can be arranged in such a way that what they were saying that Jesus Christ had arranged circumstances in such a way that he was going to fulfill these things and then proclaim that he was the Messiah and, and uh, con these people into that, you know, with certain things can be arranged. Well, certain things can't be arranged, <laughs> okay? Can you arrange where you were born? How many arranged from the city that you were going to be born in? Okay, nobody. Can you arrange who your parents were going to be? Or what nation you were going to be born in? Okay, what time period you were going to be born in? What generation? None of, none of these things, you guys, none, none of you did that, huh? Okay, you didn't arrange those things, okay? And so, obvious, okay, that's the, there was no way except for God interceding, okay, and God planning, there's no human instrument that can do all these things and line them up in such a way that those things are going to be fulfilled the way he was going to die, okay? And uh, all these, you know, where he was going to be born, all these different things, okay? So it was, uh, but anyway, Malachi. Take your Bibles and turn to Malachi chapter 3, the last book in the Old Testament. And verse 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now this is with regards, well, okay, you could fill in the blank here, but uh, this is uh, Matthew chapter 11. So just go over a few pages here. Matthew chapter 11, verse 10. Verse 10 says, For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee, and so forth. So this is talking about, uh, basically here, uh, John the Baptist. Okay? And we'll see another one here with regards to John the Baptist. But this is the prophet Malachi foretells that, that he would be a messenger that would prepare the way, the Lord. And then I uh, interjected this one here, Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to get back to Malachi again here in just a little bit. But Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15 to 19. And the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. Notice that's with a capital P from the midst of thee. And thy brethren like unto me, unto him he shall hearken. For into all that thou shalt uh, desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again. The voice of the God, Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, talking about Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So the Lord's even intimating at that time that this future prophet, with a capital P, this future Messiah, that there would be rejection, all right? And you might want to put down here, if you want to take some time there, you might want to put down John chapter 16, verse 14, and Acts chapter 3, verse 22 to 26. We'll not take time to go there right now. I want to cover some of these other things, but that's talking about this fulfillment of that. And then you can put for part F here, John the Baptist, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. We'll look at that one.
where it says here, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. May straight in this desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So this is the mission of the John the Baptist. So John the Baptist there is foretold, and this is fulfilled. Uh, the prophet, uh, well, the disciples deal with that in Acts chapter 3, and also John chapter 6, verse 14. Okay, deals with John the Baptist's ministry. So we've already covered that with regards to Malachi, and this is the re-emphasis of that. All right. Let's go on to uh, Roman numeral 3, and we'll cover some of these here. This deals with the crucifixion itself. And so you need to turn to the book of Psalms. You think of the Psalms as songs of Israel, and they are, but there's so many of them, they're actually messianic that tell prophecies of the Lord, especially during his earthly ministry. But, I, but Psalm 22 basically deals with the crucifixion. And so we won't go through all these here, but if you look here in Psalm 22, verses 10 through 17, you'll see it was... Some familiar place, I was cast upon thee from thy womb, thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a posture, and my tongue cleaveth to the jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Okay, this is talking about uh, the Roman method of crucifixion. This is about. This was written about 1,000 years before it happened. Okay, this is. Uh, they, the Jews didn't know about this procedure that the Romans had at that time. Anyway, I may tell all my bones there, uh, uh, look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them, and cast lots for my vesture. Remember that. They took his robe, and the Romans uh, 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 gambled for his garment. So this is forecast. Hey, be not far, thou far from me, O Lord, my strength. Haste me to help me. Deliver my soul from this sword, and so forth. And so, he's, and then verse 22 says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise her. We'll get to that after a bit here. But this is a, 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 a psalm that tells about pictures of the crucifixion and is referred to a number of different times. If you turn uh, forward to Psalm 41, but if you want to look at uh, the fulfillment, you can go back to Matthew 27 and 35 to 36 and John 19, 24 and 34. So you have time this week. But Psalm 41 and verse 9, he says, Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Who's he talking about there? Yeah, he's talking about Judas. That's a prophecy about Judas, Iscariot. And if you want to look at that up, you can look to Mark chapter 14 and verse 10, where he talks about that there. And there's others that go on here. Okay, you turn back to Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. Remember when the Lord was on the cross. And, of course, God the Father had forsaken him at that time. And so this is fulfilled in Matthew 27, verse 46, and so, and so forth. And then 22, verse 8, if you look there, you know, he, he's trusting on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. That's what the mockers said. Okay? And that was also told about there in the Gospels. If you look at Exodus, if you want to take time there this week, Exodus chapter 12, verse 46, that's talking about none of his bones would be broken. 
Okay, and that's fulfilled there in John chapter 19, verses 36. Then we already looked at Genesis 3, okay, verse 15, and that's referred back to there in John 19, verse 18. And then uh, take your Bibles and turn to Amos. That's after Daniel, after Hosea, Joel, and then Amos. 8 verse 9, he says, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I'll cause the earth and the clear, uh, I will darken the earth in the clear day. See, that's a picture. That's a prophecy about the crucifixion day. And that's also referred to in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 45. So I gave you those verses there so that you can take some time and look those up. Now, we're going to turn back to the book of Isaiah again for a couple chapters. This time is moving on here. But Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6, interesting verse. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Okay, so that's fulfilled there in Matthew 26, verse 67, referred to there in 27, 26, and John 18, 22. And then for Jay, you need to write down Isaiah 53. Now, this is the gospel according to Isaiah. So turn to Isaiah chapter 53. In fact, you actually have to go back to verse 13 of chapter 52, where it says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He, I'm about the servant is the Messiah. Be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred, more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. Talking about later on when the kingdom is set up for that which had been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard, shall they consider. Now, you've got a number of verses here, okay, that uh, refer uh, to uh, Isaiah chapter 53. You can go through these this week, okay, in, the, in Matthew and John and Luke and so forth. But anyway, let's just look at this chapter. And it says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Of course, the nation of Israel was a very dry ground spiritually at the, at the time the Lord Jesus was born there in Bethlehem. He hath no form nor comeliness, and we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. Remember, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, and he wasn't born in a, in a, in a palace. Okay, he was born in a manger. He is despised and rejected of men. Look down upon him. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. And so Isaiah is talking about the nation of Israel itself, that despised their own Messiah. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and he did in his ministry, didn't he? Okay, and he would heal the sick and that. And yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, not his own. He didn't have any transgressions. He didn't have any sin. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. That's referred to in uh, different places in the Gospels. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Not just some of us, but all of mankind. All of, the, of our iniquities have been laid upon him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb, that he is the lamb of God. As John the Baptist said, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as the sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison. Remember, he was put in prison that night of his betrayal, and from judgment there in Pilate's judgment hall. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off. Remember Daniel said there in chapter 9, you know, the Messiah would be cut off. He would die. And he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. You know, Christ died for all mankind, each individually. 
but he died for a nation also. He died for the nation of Israel. And so he didn't die for the United States of America. <laughs> he didn't die for Canada. Okay, he didn't die for England or France. He died for Frenchmen. He died for Americans, but he did die for the nation of Israel. And that's why the one reason the nation of Israel is going to survive, regardless of what their enemies out there say, have done and tried to do over the centuries. And he made his grave with the wicked. Remember? Okay, he was, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, who was the uh, guy that he, he borrowed the grave from there? Joseph Arimathea, right, okay. He was with the, the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, okay. He had to please the Lord to bruise him, okay. The Lord was pleased that he took care of the sins of everybody. He hath put him to grief, and thou shalt make an, his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days. That's talking about the resurrection. He would live beyond his death there, beyond the time that he was cut off. So this is taught prophesying about his resurrection. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied with his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many. Remember, in Adam, because of one man's sin, all mankind was lost. Here, because of the righteousness of one man, the Messiah, many can be made righteous. Okay? And so anyway... Uh, for he shall bear their iniquities, he will bear their sins. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, talking about between himself and the devil, okay? Because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, remember the thieves on each side. And he bare the sin of many, that's all of us. And he made intercession for the transgressors. So he made intercession for, for us, and he does today. So that then... Uh, go on here, so you might want to read through that again and go through those verses. And then go to Zechariah chapter 13. So you can fill in for K there, Zechariah. We're almost done here. And Zechariah chapter 13. Some interesting ones. This is fulfilled in Matthew 26 and Mark 14. And uh, anyway, in Zechariah 13, verse 7. And he says here, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. The Lord prophesied that himself there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, of course, the, the disciples fled. Okay, and that's brought out there in Matthew chapter 26. Okay, and then in Zechariah chapter 11. Um, turn back there a page or two. And Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 to 13. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it into the potter, a goodly price that was a prize to them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them into the potter in the house of the Lord. Okay? This is talking about his betrayal by Judas and the money that uh, he got. Okay? And also, uh, it's uh, Zechariah also that uh, prophesied about the, uh, uh, him being pierced. Okay? And so, anyway, that was, uh, that was also fulfilled here. Okay, with the time, we just about got about a minute here. Go to uh, Psalm 16, his resurrection. And this is, uh, if you look there, you'll see that's fulfilled in uh, Acts chapter 2. You can fill that blank in there. Acts chapter 2, verses 24 to 27. In Psalm 16, verses 8 to 10, where he says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. 
My glory rejoice, my flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one, talking about the Messiah, to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence, is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So there was picturing uh, the resurrection there. If you go back there, you can turn back there to Acts chapter 2. There on the day of Pentecost, I think that's when that takes place there. And verses 24 to 27. Yeah, if you look at there at verses 26, Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because I will not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Okay, that one there. And then the last one here, and you can fill in the last blank here, and uh, that's going to be uh, Psalm 22 there. Hebrews chapter 2. The last one is Hebrews. And in Psalm 22, the very last verse there of the book of Psalm 22. He says, yeah, no, it's not the last verse anyway, but I will declare my name, thy name, talking about the Father, unto my brother in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And remember after his resurrection there, and, by, uh, and that's what's talking about in John chapter 20, he told the, the women and that to tell his brother, to tell the disciples that he has been resurrected. So that's in John chapter 20, verse 17. And then in Acts chapter 2, if you turn there, again on the day of Pentecost, it is preached there. And verse 12. And they were all amazed, we're down saying, one, two, let's see here. Uh, let's see, Acts. Two verse twelve. No, I'm sorry, Hebrews two. I'm sorry, yeah, that's right. I told you to tell you it was Hebrews. Hebrews chapter two. And verse twelve. Where he says here, saying, I will declare uh, thy uh, name unto my brethren in the midst of the church where the congregation will I sing praise unto thee. So after his resurrection. He makes it known to his disciples, of course, that he was resurrected and he proclaims the, uh, the glory to the Father and that, uh, of course, the, then he commissions them later on. Any questions on that? That's a lot, okay, to deal with, okay? But you're talking about his birth, his ministry, his crucifixion, his resurrection. We only scratched the surface of it, okay, of all the various prophecies that were dealt with. Okay, let's bow for prayer. Father, be with us today. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for the Word of God and the promises of it. Uh, be with us uh, as we go to our homes that might have safety there. Thank you again for your love and grace in Jesus' name. Amen.